do it. All right, welcome. My name's Rory Martirana. I am a reference and adult services librarian at the New Haven Free Public Library with a focus on community health. Today I'm joined by Dr. Sandro Galea. Dr. Galea is a physician and an epidemiologist. He's the Dean and Robert A. Knox Professor at Boston University School of Public Health. He's been named Epidemiology Innovator by Time Magazine, a top voice in healthcare by LinkedIn, and is one of the most cited scientists in the world. His writing and work are featured regularly in national and global public media. Welcome, Dr. Galea. I'm so glad that you could join me today. Thank you for having me. It's really great to be here. So I'm going to jump right in to Please. some questions. This was uh, such a great read. Uh, it's right here. Um, if you haven't read this yet, it's available at um, several of our branch locations at the public library. Um, and it's definitely a must read. So um, just to start off, the contagion next time is different than other books I've read about COVID. Um, rather than focusing uh, more on the science behind the pandemic, you highlight the social determinants of health that led us to where we are today and kind of impacted our response to the crisis. I was wondering what inspired you to write the book and to write it through this particular lens. Yeah, so, well, some, there, 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 are, there are two things you said, one that makes me happy and one that I want to uh, correct. Okay. So the one that makes me happy is that it is a different book than things that you've seen written about the pandemic. And um, that was my intention. So really, you know, the answer, the specific answer to your question about what uh, motivated me to write it was, was exactly this question, which is that I thought there would be a lot of questions, a lot of books written about vaccines and stockpiling and sentinel surveillance systems and viruses. And all of that is important. And I want to make sure that this book is not seen as in, in uh, necessarily antagonism to that. But I thought there was an important other story that wasn't being told. Now, the part that I said, you know, semi in jest, I want to correct is you said it's not about the science. I actually would argue that the book is also about the science. It's just a different science. And it's the science that recognizes that the consequences of a pandemic are not just about the virus and the infectivity of the virus, but also about the world around us. I mean, the fundamental thesis of the book, which I know we're going to lead to into another question, is that unless we deal with the forces that determine how we live and what happens to a pandemic, it doesn't matter how good our vaccines are, we're still going to have a fairly catastrophic outcome with pandemics as we have had with this one. And I think, and the observations I draw are also based on science, just a different kind of science. So a recurring theme within the book is the relationship between uh, race relations in our country and with uh, health disparities and health inequalities or inequities. Um, can you talk a bit about that and what lessons your your book yeah. sort of says we need to learn in order to improve access for everybody? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so so this is not a book about race, um, but nonetheless, race is an inexorable part of the story of the book, and it weaves its way through. And in fact, as anybody who reads towards to the end will find, the name of the book is a nod to race. The name of the book is a nod to the fire next time, which is James Baldwin's really powerful book about race about 67 years ago. Um, but the, to my mind, race has featured in everything in terms of the determinants of how we've done in the pandemic. And, and, and we could take that at multiple levels. So number one, we know that Black Americans, people of color in general, are less healthy than our white or majority group of Americans. Now, why is that? That is because of centuries of disenfranchisement, of marginalization. That is, uh, the in particular group of Black Americans, particularly Black Americans descended from slaves, there is slavery and the then Jim Crow era. And all of that has resulted in worse working conditions, worse living conditions, less access to nutritious food, less access to exercise, more exposure to violence, all of which has resulted in having the health of Black Americans being consistently worse than the health of, say, white Americans over the past many centuries. Now, that mattered because the biggest driver of COVID being a severe disease was having pre-existing conditions, was having underlying diseases. So if you have a group that is more likely to have underlying illness, and that's the case with minoritized groups in this country, that group was at higher risk of the consequence of COVID than the majority group. So race really shapes that insofar as race has shaped our health for decades and centuries. And there's nothing new about this statement, but what COVID did, I think, is it showed how important 
forces like race are and how important it is that we tackle underlying conditions before something like COVID hit. Another way in which race has mattered is that our occupational structure, our social structure, our economic structure is very patterned by racial advantage and disadvantage. For example, if you are from a immigrant or from a family, a minority family, which over the decades and over the centuries has not been in a position to accumulate wealth, you are going to have less wealth and likely to have a job which requires more in-person presence than people who have actually been able to be in families where they've accumulated wealth. And we know that particularly when the virus hit before we had vaccines, when things were new, being in jobs that required in-person presence required, resulted in much more likelihood of getting the virus. So again, the risk of getting the virus, the risk of having severity of infection were both patterned by race and race as what it represents in terms of a social and economic construct, what it represents today and what it has represented in our society for decades and centuries. Uh, so you make it clear from the start of the book that health is more than just medicine um, and that conceptualizing health and healthcare as just within the scope of a doctor or hospitals or medicine sort of does a disservice to us, to our society and to public health in general. Um, would you be able to elaborate on this for those who maybe haven't read the book yet? Yes. So I've made the point in the book and I've made the point in other places that health is not the same as healthcare. And uh, we often as a society mix the two up. And sometimes I challenge people to say, you know, when you have a dinner party or hanging out at the bar with your friends, start a conversation about health. And you, you can say, hey, I happened to see this talk at the New Haven Public Library, free, free public library. And this person was talking about health. And just start that conversation and see how long it takes for somebody to use the word healthcare interchangeably with health. And it's always in less than five minutes. Like, like we slip into the language of healthcare instead of health all the time. And, uh, the, and that rests on our cultural norm that our health is generated by our doctors, our nurses, by our health system. But in fact, we understand this through science very clearly that while doctors and nurses matter, they matter for when we're sick to restore us to health. Most of our health is not generated by medicine. It's not generated by healthcare. It's generated by the world around us. And perhaps the biggest, the best evidence of that is the simple observation that the biggest triumph of health of the past 150 years has been the fact that our life expectancy between 1800 to 1900 increased, doubled, essentially until about 1800, humans had life expectancy of about 40. Now it's around 80. And, and that increase had nothing to do with medicine, nothing to do with healthcare, it had everything to do with cleaning up cities, less pollution, safer, safer water to drink, safer food to eat, better opportunities to exercise, less underlying, fewer underlying diseases, less exposure to violence, having economic opportunities that resulted in people having stable, non-chaotic lives. All of that is what went into creating a much healthier world. And that had nothing to do with medicine and healthcare. And the, again, this is not an argument against medicine and healthcare. When I'm sick, I want to have an excellent doctor, as I'm sure you do as well. Um, so we want to have excellent systems that can restore us to health when we're sick. But it is all about recognizing that health is a product of the world around us. Healthcare is of particular import when we're dealing with restoring people to health from sickness. So as, a, as an epidemiologist, were you surprised by the way the pandemic unfolded here? Yeah, I, I suppose I wasn't surprised. And... Uh, um, I, in, in, I wrote a piece in the Washington Post, I think in March of 2020, um, essentially outlining the same concerns. So I sort of saw it a couple of years ago, as did others. I was the only one, I mean, several others did. And, and perhaps what is a little bit depressing is that it wasn't a surprise. That, that is, that's perhaps what is, uh, what, what is um, more noisome, in, in that we knew that the social and economic patterns are going to sh shape what we experience in the pandemic. And despite knowing that, we still let that happen. We still let that be the case. So in, um, you know, to go back to the first question you asked me is why did I write the book? I suppose I wrote the book because I wanted to make sure that this conversation becomes embedded so that we are 
it's not that we'd be surprised in the future because we know this already, so that in the future we actually avoid going down this path. So, um, and you, you do sort of address this a, a little bit in the book, but um, I wanted to kind of ask you, so there's been sort of this influx of misinformation or people call inf infodemic. Um, mm -hmm. That's really, I mean, and it was existent before the pandemic, but it's really taken hold lately with the onset of it and as it's progressed, especially with vaccines. Um, how does social media and um, the spread of misinformation play into the themes that you bring up in your book? Yeah. So this was the first national large scale disaster that we lived through in the era of social media. And as a result, we have had to learn how to communicate through that medium. If I, you were to go back 20 years, the 9-11 terrorist attacks were the first large scale national disaster that was lived through in the era of 24 seven cable news. And at the time, there was quite a bit of conversation about what does it mean to go through a national disaster that is sort of being played out over and over and over again in the media in a way that hadn't happened before. Like we, we had not, no such experience before. So I think these technologies come and they shape how we communicate and how we see particular events. Fast forward 20 years, COVID happens, and it is a time when social media is rapidly displacing our public square. And we have had to try to learn how to communicate in a time of social media. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because social media, of course, is a very particular medium. It's a medium that is algorithmically driven, has particular biases built in. It, um, it rewards assertion, it rewards disputation, it rewards certitude, and all of that has led us many times down the wrong path in a time of COVID. And you know, you, you mentioned in the, the infodemic of misinformation. Misinformation has can can thrive in social media, both because things that are stated assertively or as a contrarian way rise to the surface in social media quite a bit. And also because social media allows us to create enclaves within social media where you end up listening only to the people you want to listen to, right? So as a result, it echoes everything you're thinking. And all of a sudden, you know, if you and I are listening to each other and we're saying the same thing, then all of a sudden I say, well, everybody's thinking this way. Well, it may not be everybody, it may just be you and I, but we just happen to be listening to each other. So social media, and, and, and this is not, I want to be very clear, but it's not a criticism of social media, just like it wasn't a criticism of the 24 seven news, um, news culture that influenced how we saw 9-11. The medium is what it is. And, you know, I leave it to others. I leave it to cultural anthropologists to discuss the merit and the merit of the medium. But be that as it may, it shaped how we talked about COVID. And as a result, we had to learn how to navigate COVID while this echo chamber was going on, while this medium was dominating our conversation that rewarded a particular disputatious, contrarian, assertive way of stating perspectives, leaving no room for doubt and nuance, actually at a time when arguably we needed much more doubt, nuance, and humility than we've ever needed as a country. Mm -hmm. So it did social media complicate how we dealt with COVID? Absolutely. I think it would be very difficult not to, um, not to acknowledge that social media complicated. Does that mean that we cannot navigate a future crisis with social media? I don't think so. I, think it, I, I do think it is the truth that we are novices in this medium collectively. And I, I don't mean the generation. I just mean we as a, as a culture. Mm -hmm. And... We need to learn how to do better at making sure we communicate, making sure that we communicate on a certain time of uncertainty, making sure that we actually do not allow this sectioning off of particular parts of the population from one another and create genuine dialogue while social media re remains the dominant form of communication. Now, it's entirely possible that in 20 years, there will be a totally different dominant form of communication, in which case this conversation becomes a historical footnote. Um, so public figures like Elon Musk and Donald Trump make several appearances in the book. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I'm, it kind of reminded me of recently how Joe Rogan's really been in the spotlight for platforming the um, conspiracy theories and that sort of thing. And there was a whole um, petition for Spotify to, you know, have a misinformation policy in place and such. Um, so I'm just curious from you as a public health, from a public health perspective and as a, 
actual doctor. Um, what are your thoughts on this controversy and in general, just public figures um, speaking on health? At, at what point do they become a threat to our public health? And do you think censoring them even helps or does that just make things worse? Because then they're kind of like martyred. Yeah. Well, I'll start with the last quite part of the question because I think it's the easiest part of the question. Uh, I think we as a society should be very careful about endorsing, um, removing anybody from any communication medium. I think history is rife with examples about um, how that power is misused. And uh, the, um, you know, I, I, I'm well aware of the fact that within public health, like we are um, often the people in public health tend to be left leaning. And uh, the, for example, the removal of Donald Trump from Twitter was uh, greeted not unreasonably, I think, with, um, with uh, some satisfaction and many, uh, many on the left. But I, I think it should give all of us pause as to what it means as a society to be giving a private company, ultimately a private company, the, the power to silence individuals, whoever they are. Because w one may well agree with their decision in that one particular moment, but we really, I think, should be sophisticated enough to say, how do we know we're going to agree with them the next time around? So, so I think the notion of um, stopping speech and recognizing the legal complexities of it, because this is speech that's been mediated by private platforms, who, who, which really, who really have the have the prerogative to allow some and not others on their platform. Um, I think it's something that we should be troubled by as a society, which lead which would lead me to suggest that the best way of countering noxious speech is through other speech and through more speech that actually sheds light on things. So that's on the on the latter part of your question. But now to, to go on, on the first part of the question. Um, I think there's there's no doubt that um, uh, particular individuals said things that were harmful to us resolving how we deal with this pandemic. And I think it's um, I mean it, it is it is in no way making reference to any obscure incident to talk about the fact that uh, President Trump made statements that were simply wrong, that were simply not based on science and some of which could lead people down harmful paths if they followed his advice. Um, so so there, there, that, to my mind, is inarguable. I think it's a really difficult question for us as a society to say how much of that are we willing to tolerate, how much are we willing to restrict speech that is harmful, right? This goes back to, my, to, to, to the point I started with. And to strike that balance, I think we have to have the confidence that right and wrong are always clearly delineated. And I would argue that while sometimes they are, and perhaps in the case of Donald Trump's tweets, they were, much of the time, the line is very blurry and we need to be very careful about when we say we're going to allow anybody the power to draw that line. So we have a question from a participant. Vito asks, do you think that this crisis highlights the need to critique the nature of capitalism? I'm quite intrigued what the Cubans are doing in providing vaccines available to the third world. Yeah. yeah so I'm often asked about capitalism. And, and I, um, I, to, to answer it, I, I actually would like to move beyond the word capitalism. I think words like capitalism and socialism are very politically charged and simply talk about market-based economies, which ultimately is the same thing. Um, my read of history is that um, there's abundant evidence that market-based economies are the economies that all things being equal create most opportunities for more people to flourish with the big caveat that the big downside of market-based economy is that the creation of inequality, which is inequitable, and people being left behind. So to my mind, learning from history about the durability, the greater durability of market-based economies versus more centrally planned economies, what we want to ascribe to is a market-based economy that recognizes that market-based economies tend to generate inequities and builds in mechanisms to make sure that nobody's left behind, to build in social safety nets that look after those who do not flourish in those kind of economies. The, um, the, the, the sorry, I'm just looking at the, the, the question. Um, uh, the reference to um, Cubans and uh, providing vaccine, I think, you know, I think there is no question that um, more autocratic countries, now it's, a different, it's different than the, than the means of economic production, which is what market-based economy is about, but that shifts then into the type of government. There's no question that more autocratic governments 
can be more effective in delivering particular treatments or in imposing particular restrictions. I mean, you need to look no further than China. China is the only country in the world that continues to follow a zero COVID policy. And it does that through imposing enormous lockdowns on tens of millions of people when there are cases in particular neighborhoods. That would be to us in this country unacceptable. And I would argue should be to us unacceptable unless there truly is a cataclysmic event that required it. And, but there's no question that China can do that because of a, a centrally driven system of, of power and governance that dictates and where essentially the apparatus of the state falls in, line, uh, falls in line. And that is a political question. It's a social cultural question about does one want to live in that kind of environment? I would actually go back to my caution about speech and my caution about that is that to say, um, I think it is very appealing to have a centrally driven um, uh, system of concentrating power in the hands of a few that can dictate efforts that might be good for the health of the public in the short term. And what are the implications of such restrictions in the long term for the well being of everybody, just like while limiting the access of some individuals to particular forms of speech or, or expression of speech might be appealing in the short term, what does it mean in the long term? So this sort of relates to what you've been discussing. You devote a lot of this book to what you refer to as foundational forces of health. Um, could you explain a little bit about what these forces are and how they have potential to impact our approach to the next crisis? Yeah, so the foundational forces of health are what I've called earlier in this conversation, the conditions of the world around us. It is where we live. It is the condition, our access to housing. It is whether or not we have a stable occupation that with a livable wage that allows us to balance our work with our time off, whether we have safe working conditions, whether we have polluted air that we're breathing or whether we are living either in a place with tremendous pollution from industrial pollution or maybe from a, a bus depot right next door to our house, whether we have access to nutritious food that is not overly calorie dense, whether we have access to clean water, whether we actually have safe parks around us where we can exercise. These are the foundational forces, whether we live in a world where there is gender equity and where you don't have women being afraid of being becoming victims of violence, any of those, these are all foundational forces. And those forces are the forces that generate health. And those forces are what results in a world where people are healthy or less healthy. And as I pointed out earlier, in the context of a, vac of a virus where getting the virus is, and, and how sick you get from the virus is directly a function of whether or not you're sick to begin with, these foundational forces then determine not just underlying health, but they determine your likelihood of becoming sick with COVID-19. So I have um, another question hear from a viewer, how do you see the future of the pandemic playing out based on recent history? Say it again, sorry? It's how do you see the future of the pandemic playing out based ah. on recent history? Um, well, by future of the pandemic, if we mean the course of COVID-19, mm. I, I think the course of COVID-19, um, it's really a binary course, depending or if there is a more virulent variant that reemerges or not. If there is no, no more virulent variant than, than uh, Omicron that emerges, I think we are uh, exiting from the pandemic stage of uh, COVID-19. If there is another variant that is more virulent, then I think that's the key. And by more virulent, I mean that's stronger, that causes more, more sickness. Um, that then all bets are up because I think then we enter a phase where we again need to adopt measures to protect ourselves from the virus. Um, if I take the question as a more meta question as to how I see these things unfolding, for future pandemics. I think nothing redeems the fact that a million people are dying um, and will have died from COVID in this country. That's a terrible tragedy, but it does the tragedy, it, it deepens the tragedy if we don't learn from the moment. And my hope is that we are learning from the moment. And as a result, once time passes and we've digested, we've had these conversations, we will be better at dealing 
with the next pandemic by having had conversations like this one, having had the conversations about vaccine, having had the conversations about how we make sure we move from actually having vaccine technologically successfully and getting it to as many people as possible. How we've, having had those conversations, having learned from those conversations. So the book discusses several ways that, um, like several types of mistakes that we made in this country in our collective response um, to the pandemic. What do you think the biggest or, or most impactful mistake was that we could try not to repeat next time? Yeah, I'm not sure I know a biggest one. You know, in the book, I use this metaphor, as you, as you know, of a ship, of a ship going yeah. through a storm. And uh, the metaphor is that you have a ship going through a storm, right? And you want a ship to get through the storm. There are three key elements. Number one is the, is the captain. Number two is the crew. And number three is the state of the ship itself. The captain is political leadership. The crew is our help as a population. And the state of the ship itself is the infrastructure that we have that's available for us to respond to public health crisis, our capacity to develop tests quickly, to, to, to identify people, to isolate people, all of that. And in this case, I think we failed in all three of them. I think our political leadership was very confused about what to do and how to deal with this uh, rapidly spreading pandemic. Number two, we as a, as a, as a country, were less healthy than we could have been. So as a result, the crew was unprepared to extend the metaphor. And the ship was in poor conditions because we had his, we had underinvested in the infrastructure to create a healthier uh, populations for decades before. So I think we failed on all three. Um, which one do I think is most important? I think we need all three of them. I think we need political leadership that is nimble and agile and responsive to these things. I think we need to be healthier as a, as a population and we need to have the public health infrastructure we need. I'm curious about your writing process for the book. It's divided into four separate parts. So you start off with sort of um, the US and the world in general, what, what our status was and kind of like what led up to this and you kind of get into the foundational forces. Um, and then you talk about values and then science. Um, did, it, did you have it planned out this way or did it kind of like build upon itself? Um, can you talk yeah. a little bit about yeah, no, it was it was planned out this way. It was, um, you know, sort of. Um, it started from the top level outline that roughly looked like this, and then um, I built the sort of the the sections underneath it. Um, uh, the I mean, I have different writing processes for different types of books. Um, this book is more of a sort of linear book, which sort of starts from you know the beginning and goes through to the end. I mean, other books I've done are more sort of digestible essays that then I string together, and those those are sort of written. In, um, in different time. And then I, 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 I look for the overarching message and how they tie together. But this book was, um, this book was written in the second half of 2020. Um, so that really the, the, um, the second six months of the pandemic. And uh, then it came out in November of 2020, 21. These things take about a year or two from when you finish the manuscript until they actually are published. Um, and the, in, in many ways, I suppose my thinking was evolving as the pandemic was unfolding. I know some people have said, you know, how could you write about a pandemic while a pandemic is still happening? And, and the answer is, in many respects, writing about it was therapy, that uh, it was, it helped me process and helped me sharpen my thoughts about the pandemic. And I try to be careful to not write anything in there that would be, that the data could, could change sort of what I was saying and the things I wrote were more evergreen. And I think the book stands up well that way. I don't think there's anything in there that has become outdated. And largely, of course, you know, I wasn't talking specifically about how many cases we're going to have at the end or anything like that. I was talking about these underlying forces that are that are permanent. And that. And I knew when I was writing the book that I wanted to write, I wasn't writing a history of the pandemic. I wasn't writing a history of the pandemic. You need to wait until the pandemic's over because I write a history of the pandemic. I was writing a book about these observations that I thought were going to be just as true in fall of 2020 as they would be in fall 21 as they would be fall of 2022. I noticed also it's in past tense. Um, was that an intentional decision? Um, it was an intentional decision to write in the past tense, um, um, recognizing that most people will be reading it when the pandemic is in the past tense. And um, the, the, you know, you and I are talking in 2022 when uh, the pandemic is maybe at its tail end, but, uh, and the book was released in fall of 2021, but, my hope is that the book will be um, seen as a resource a long time before. Uh, sorry, a long time after. I mean, <laughs> my brain did the opposite of what I was thinking. Yeah. 
Uh, I have a, an, a, an anom, uh, anonymous question. So how would you compare the experiences of other countries that lack some of the US's societal issues um, with, with COVID-19 to that of the US? Yeah, there, there are, uh, I'm sometimes asked this question, sort of which country did, you know, should we be like? And the answer is, I don't know which country we should be like, because different countries have very different contexts and different countries did particular things right. But we can learn from different countries that things, right? So for example, um, a place like South Korea had an excellent public health infrastructure. They were able to stand up testing, contact tracing, identifying cases pretty quickly. That's one example of, I think, a country that did, did something particular right. Um, I think we can look at uh, countries like Denmark have been much more nimble than we have been about the physical distancing, masking, bringing on, taking off, being nuanced and being able to move with... Uh, with the data than we have been. So I think there are different countries that adapted differently. I don't think it's fair to us to say, well, then we should be like South Korea or we should be like Denmark. I mean, these are much smaller countries, but actually much less, much less heterogeneity than we have. So I do think that each country has its own particular context and that context manifested in how it was experienced. But I think that's not in contradiction with saying that we should learn from other countries and it is on us to take the best examples from other countries and incorporate them into how we think about our response in future. There's a question from Kevin. He says, the timing of this talk is particularly fortuitous to me. I just finished Dr. Galea's excellent book and will be visiting his home country in a couple weeks. Um, have, the American pe have the American people have learned the lessons from the pandemic that Dr. Galea believes we should have. I'm concerned not only with the politicization of the pandemic, but more generally the politicization of scientific understanding. Yeah. Yeah, it's an excellent question, Kevin. Um, I'm glad that you're visiting Malta. Um, uh, the, I, I, hope, I hope that we have learned these lessons. I, uh, I suppose my answer to the question is a glass half full, glass half empty. If, uh, if, if, if I'm feeling glass half empty, I'll say, well, I'm not, sometimes I'm not sure how much we have learned, but if I'm being glass half full, and I'd like to be glass half full if I all I can, I think the very fact that we're having this conversation is a sign that we're willing to learn. I think the very fact that uh, um, Rory, you invited me to speak here is, uh, is a sign that we are willing to open our minds to, to different perspectives that can illuminate how we deal with the next pandemic. And I have, I suppose I have confidence in the observation that I have confidence in, 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 in that we as a country have evolved and learned much before. And this, this is a moment, I think, of introspection and learning. And my hope is that the next few years are given to being careful about what we've learned to make sure that we take the right lessons forward so that we do not make the same mistakes again. So something I really enjoyed about your book and I feel isn't usually discussed or isn't discussed quite enough is your emphasis on empathy and compassion and humility and how we need to approach public health that way. Um, you reiterate uh, several times in the book how choosing health will require us to employ those values. Could you speak to that a little bit and how those values can help help us improve public health and health equity? Yes, thank you. The, I've come to think, I've thought a lot about compassion and I've come to feel like compassion is central to thinking about health because of the commodification of health in that we continue to fail to see health as a public good. And the reason for that, I think, is because we don't think of health, we think of sick care. This goes back to the health versus healthcare idea. And if we think of, I can buy my own sick care, meaning if I'm sick, I can buy my own doctor and you Rory can buy your own doctor, right? Then we think, well, there's nothing that, 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 that unites us. You can, you can take care of your own doctor, I can take care of my own doctor, right? That's uh, if one thinks of sick care. But when we realize that your health and my health are driven by our access to housing, to parks and recreation, to the air around us, to the water we drink, the food we eat, we realize, wait, wait a second, 
you don't own those, I don't own those, those are shared goods. That means they're public goods. And that means, to my mind, it pushes us to have the compassion to realize that we want to have those public goods that help all of us, because if they don't help all, any of us, if they don't help all of us, they don't help any of us. So that leads us into having the compassion to say, we want a world where because of our shared humanity, we are all promoting one another's health. And, and I don't think you can get that without compassion. Now, I've also made the distinction in this book and in previous writing between compassion and empathy. And empathy means I don't want you to suffer because I can see the world through your eyes and I can imagine myself suffering if I see you suffer. To my mind, compassion is a higher order concern, which is I don't want you to suffer because I care about you because of our shared humanity. I may not be able to see the world through your eyes at all, actually. I have different set of experiences. I have different contexts that I actually, I don't really understand your particular context that leads to your not being healthy, but I actually still care about it because I care about you as a fellow human being. And I think compassion arises from and is coincident with seeing health as a public good. So uh, another question from a viewer, can you talk about the role of mental health and substance abuse during the pandemic? Yeah, this has been one of the um, one of many, many distressing features of the pandemic, which is the um, increase in poor mental health. And we, our group, um, in a lot of my science, I do a lot of work around uh, mental health. So our group has done quite a bit of work around um, um, uh, the mental health consequences of the pandemic, particularly focusing on anxiety and depression, showing, for example, a threefold increase in um, anxiety and, and depression um, during COVID that not wasn't just an increase, but also persisted for more than a year, which is really quite dramatic because on, after previous disasters, you typically have about a twofold increase and it goes down. It actually goes down over time. The, um, so there has been a tremendous increase in uh, people who are depressed, people with anxiety and concomitant substance use. There, was, there were 100,000 people who died from um, opioid overdose between March 2020 to March 2021. That is extraordinary. That is about a 30% increase over what it was in the previous one year period, about, which was about 70,000. And these are consequences of the pandemic. They're consequences of our worry about the pandemic, but also consequences of the actions that we took and when we legitimately had to take to restrict movement, to have people um, in lockdown, to, to close schools, have people wear masks, etc. And I think it's really important that we have the public conversation about the, about the importance of and the burden of mental poor mental health and to recognize that that should be part of our calculus. This should be part of what we weigh as we think about the actions we want to take in uh, controlling the pandemic. 100,000 drug overdoses is a very real concern and that should be part of our calculation about how much do we want to keep people away from one another, away from their social interactions, that it, and as a result, increase poor mental health and increase risk of substance use. So this should all be part of our thinking. Are you hopeful that that um, our perspective on, on health will change and that will shift the conversation and be able to learn from our mistakes? I choose to be hopeful. You know, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a quote which I like from... Uh, a Canadian scholar, which is um, optimism, although I'll convert it to hope, is a is a an expression of political resistance, and uh, and I, I like that because I do think that um, one chooses hope, and I think we should choose hope because it um, it creates an aspiration for us to move forward towards. And to go back to my ship analogy, um, the other fourth element of the of the ship going through a storm analogy that I mentioned in the book is the direction of where the ship is headed. And the direction of where she said it is what we set for ourselves. And that, that should be the, um, an aspiration towards a healthier world. Um, can you speak a little bit about the, um, the differences or, uh, between um, inequality and inequities? I know that sometimes yeah. I'll have conversations and people will be, yeah. will conflate the two. Yeah, so inequality is 
numerical, it's quantitative. It's like, it's, it's unequal. Inequality means unequal. So it's unequal income, unequal health. Now, inequality is a feature of the human condition, has always been, will always be. And what, what we as humans, I think, need to grapple with, and we have obviously grappled with through centuries of religious thought and philosophy, is what inequality is unjust. And that is where inequality becomes inequity. Inequality that is not fair becomes inequity. And I was with what does it mean? Well, of course, it depends on our definition of fairness. But I think most people would agree that if you have two people whose conditions are all held, are all the same, but one chooses to work harder than the other one, the person who chooses to work harder, it's okay for them to have more income. I think we would mostly agree with that. And that is inequality that is not inequity. But inequity manifests if one person works the same as the other one and doesn't have equal income. Or inequity manifests if one person comes from a history of marginalization disadvantage that does not give them the opportunity to engage in working harder. So inequity is inequality that's unjust. To talk about health, for example, um, more specifically, inequity in health is when you have different health indicators that are driven by less access to resources. So for example, inequity in hypertension. Black Americans have more hypertension than white Americans, largely driven to underlying health conditions that are largely driven to restriction of opportunity. That we consider to be a health inequity. There are some conditions that are genetic randomness that result in some people getting them, some people not. Those are inequalities. They're not really unjust, they are re really randomness and they result of randomness. But most health, most health inequality is considered to be inequitable because it reflects unjust underlying conditions. I have uh, one more question for you, actually, we flew, flew through the questions, but I'm wondering what major takeaways you're hoping this book will leave your readers with. Yeah, I, I suppose what I really would love is this book to have the readers catalyze a conversation in their own spaces about the inextricability of the world around us from health outcomes that in a time of pandemic, how we did with the pandemic, who got infected with the virus was directly linked to underlying health before, which was underlying linked to underlying conditions before, underlying linked to histories of justice, to histories of racism, to whether or not people had access to these resources that generate health. And once we recognize that, we use the pandemic as a reason to work towards improving those underlying conditions. That's the fundamental message of the book. Okay, so I was just, do you have any other final comments for us? No, your, your last question was perfect for final comments. <laughs> so I just wanted to, just a quick housekeeping announcement. Um, on Wednesday, the 23rd, uh, my colleague Allison Botello, our local history librarian, will be chatting with a uh, genealogist, Diane Wormsley, who will discuss issues unique to African-American genealogy research. If you're interested in that, there's a link in the Zoom chat that you can register. And I just wanna thank you again, Sandro, for, for joining me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and I so enjoyed reading your book. Well, thank you for having me. I really, I really enjoyed it. And thank you to everybody who participated either here or on Facebook. Thank you. Yep. Take good care.